Hello guys, it's my first time that I am live on YouTube. I've been live on various other channels like Instagram and Facebook many times, but it's my first time that I'm live on YouTube. And let me tell you, I've given it a lot of thought what to do, what not to do. And then I finally decided to do something that I am really good at, which is just reading well. Okay, like I'm a decent orator. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to use this platform to revive a certain skill that I had, which was reading. I used to read voraciously, but I have forgotten how to read because I don't read books as much as I would like to. So I'm going to use this platform for myself to read books and I'm going to read it loud so that if you guys enjoy a good read, you can just stream in and join in into my stream and then we can I can read it out loud to you and you can listen to me in this process probably you'll learn a certain trick of how to read a good story to someone and you know the art of storytelling also if you don't find any of those tricks useful for you at least you'll enjoy the story so my very first one I'm going to read out a very simple story from Jeffrey Archer because I want to start with something very very simple and I hope you enjoy it by the way my name is Rudhima Patek so let's start let's start with the story and let's start with my very first youtube streaming live streaming well the story is called one night stand okay and it goes like this the two men had first met at the age of five when they were placed side by side at school for no more compelling reason than their names thompson and townsend came one after each other on the class register. They soon became best friends. A tie which at that age is more binding than any marriage. After passing the 11 plus examination, they proceeded to the local grammar school with no Timson, Stoolies or Tomlinsons to divide them. And having completed seven years in that academic institution, reached an age when one either has to go to work or to university. They opted for the latter on the grounds that work should be pulled off until the last possible moment. Happily, they both possessed enough brains and native wit to earn themselves places at Durham University to read English. Undergraduate life turned out to be as sociable as primary school. They both enjoyed English, tennis, cricket, good food, and girls. Luckily, in the last of these predilicate, okay, I don't know how to pronounce this name. Luckily, in the last of these predilections, they differed only on points of details. Michael, who was six foot two, willowy with dark curly hair, preferably tall, bossy blondes, with blue eyes and long legs. Adrian, a stocky man of 5 foot 10 with straight sandy hair, always fell for small, slim, dark haired, dark eyed girls. So whenever Adrian came across a girl that Michael took an interest in or vice versa, whether she was an undergraduate or barmaid, the one would happily exaggerate the friend's virtues. Thus they spent three idyllic years in unison at Durham gaining considerably more than a Bachelor of Arts degree. As neither of them had impressed the examiners enough to waste a further two years expounding their theories for a PhD, they could no longer avoid the real world. Twin Dick Whittingans, they set off for London, where Michael joined the BBC as a trainee, while Adrian was signed up by Benton and Bowles the international advertising agency as an accounts assistant. They acquired a small flat in the Earl's Court Road, which they painted orange and brown, and proceeded to live the life of two young blades, for that is undoubtedly how they saw themselves. Oh, there are about... Both men spent a further five years in this blissful bachelor state until they each fell for a girl who fulfilled the particular requirements. They were married within weeks of each other, Michael to a tall blue-eyed blonde whom he met while playing tennis at the Hurlingham Club, Adrian to a slim, dark-eyed, dark-head executive in charge of the Kellogg's Conflicts account. Both officiated as the other's best man and each proceeded to sire three children at 
yearly intervals. And that again, they differed. But as before, only one, only on points of details. Michael having two sons and a daughter, Adrian, two daughters and a son. Each became godfather to the other's firstborn son. Marriage hardly separated them in anything as they continued to follow much of their old routine, playing cricket together at weekends in the summer and football in the winter, not to mention regular luncheons during the week. Well, they played cricket, certainly I like Michael and Adrian. After the celebration of his 10th wedding anniversary, Michael, now a senior producer with Thames Television, admitted rather coyly to Adrian that he had had his first affair. He had been unable to resist a tall, well built blonde from the typing pool who was offering more than shorthand at 70 words a minute. Only a few weeks later, Adrian, now a senior account manager with Paul and Dean, also went under, selecting a journalist from Fleet Street who was seeking some inside information on one of the companies he represented. She became a tax deducible item. After that, the two men quickly fell back into their old routine. Any help they could give each other was provided unstingingly, creating no conflict of interest because of their different tastes. Their married lives were not suffering, or so they convinced each other. And at 35, having come through the swinging 60s unscathed, they began to make the most of the 70s. Early in that decade, Thames Television decided to send Michael off to America to edit an ABC film about living in New York. The consumption by British viewers. Adrian, who had always wanted to see the eastern seaboard, did not find it hard to arrange a trip at the same time as he claimed it was necessary for him to carry out some more than usually surplus research for an Anglo-American tobacco company. The two men enjoyed a lively week together in New York, the highlight of which was a party held by ABC on the final evening to view the edited edition of Michael's film on New York, an Englishman's view of the Big Apple. When Michael and Adrian arrived at the ABC studios, they found the party was already well underway and both entered the room together, looking forward to a few drinks and an early night before their journey back to England the next day. They spotted her at exactly the same moment. She was of medium height and build, with soft green eyes and auburn hair. A striking combination of both man's fantasies. Without another thought, each knew exactly where he desired to end up that particular night. And two minds with but a single idea. They advanced purposefully upon her. Hello, my name is Michael Thompson. Hello, she replied. I'm Debbie Kendall. And I'm Adrian Transent. She offered a hand and both tried to grab it. When the party had come to an end, they had, between them, discovered that Debbie Kendall was an ABC floor producer on the evening news spot. She was divorced and had two children who lived with her in New York. But neither of them was any nearer to impressing her, if only because each worked so hard to outdo the other. They both showed off abnormally and even squabbled over fetching their new companion, her food and drink. In the other's absence, they found themselves running down their closet, closest friend in a subtle but damaging way. Adrian's a nice chap, if it wasn't for his drinking, you know, said Michael. Super fellow Michael, such a lovely wife. You should see his three adorable children, said Adrian. They both escorted Debbie home and reluctantly left her on the doorstep of a 68th Street apartment. She kissed the two of them, pre-functionally on the cheek, thanked them and said goodnight. They walked back to the hotel in silence. When they reached their home on the 19th floor of the plaza, it was Michael who spoke first. I'm sorry, he said. I made a bloody fool of myself. I was every bit as bad, said Adrian. We shouldn't have fought over a woman. We never have done that in the past. Agreed, said Michael. 
So why not an honourable compromise? What do you suggest? Now, as we both return to London tomorrow morning, let's agree whichever one of us comes back first. Perfect, said Adrian. And they shook hands to seal the bargain. As if they were both back at school playing a cricket match and hard to decide on who should bat first. The deal made, they climbed into the respective beds and slept soundly. Once back in London, both men did everything in their power to find an excuse for returning to New York. Neither contacted Debbie Kendall by phone or letter as it would have broken their gentleman's agreement. But when the weeks grew to be months, both became despondent, and it seemed that neither was going to be given the opportunity to return. Then Adrian was invited to LA to address a media conference. He remained unbearably smug about the whole trip, confident he would be able to drop into New York on the way back to London. It was Michael who discovered that British Airways was offering cheap tickets for wives who accompanied their husbands on a business trip. Adrian was therefore unable to return via New York. Michael breathed a sigh of relief, which turned to triumph when he was selected to go to Washington and cover the President's address to Congress. He suggested to the head of outside broadcast that it would be wise to drop into New York on the way home and strengthen the contacts he had previously made with ABC. The head of outside broadcast agreed. He told Michael he must be back the following day to cover the opening of Parliament. Adrian phoned up Michael's wife and briefed her on cheap trips to the States when accompanying your husband. How kind of you to be so thoughtful, Adrian, but alas, my school never allows off time during term. And in any case, she added, I have a dreadful fear of flying. Michael was very understanding about his wife's phobia and went off to book a single ticket. Michael flew into Washington on the following Monday and called Debbie Kendall from his hotel room, wondering if she would even remember the two vain, glorious Englishmen she had briefly met some months before. And if she did, whether she would also recall which one he was. Well, he dialed nervously and listened to the ringing tone. Was she in? Was she even in New York? At last, a click in a soft voice said, Hello. Hello, Debbie. It's Michael Thompson. Hello, Michael. What a nice surprise. Are you in New York? No, Washington. But I'm thinking of flying up. You wouldn't be free for dinner on Thursday by any chance. Oh, um, let me check my diary. Michael held his breath as he waited. It seemed like hours. Fantastic. Shall I pick you up around? Oh, sorry. Yes, that seems to be fine, said Debbie. Oh, fantastic. Shall I pick you up around eight? Yes, thank you, Michael. I look forward to seeing you then. Heartened by this early success, Michael immediately penned a telegram of commiseration. Now, this is another word I need to learn. Commiseration to Adrian on his sad loss. Adrian didn't reply. Michael took the shuttle up to New York on the Thursday afternoon as soon as he finished editing the president's speech for the London office. After settling into another hotel room, this time insisting on a double bed just in case Debbie's children were at home, he had a long bath and a slow shave. Cutting himself twice and slapping on a little too much after shave, he rummaged around for his most telling tie, shirt and suit, and after he had finished dressing, he studied himself in the mirror, carefully combing his freshly washed hair to make the long, thin strands appear casual, as well as cover the parts where his hair was beginning to recede. Recede. What's wrong? Recede. After a final check, he was able to convince himself that he looked less than his 38 years. Michael then took the lift down to the ground floor and stepping out of the plaza on to a neon lit 5th Avenue, he headed jauntily towards 68th Street. En route, he acquired a dozen roses from a little shop at the corner of 65th Street and Madison Avenue and, humming to himself, proceeded confidently. He arrived at the front door of Debbie Kendall's little brownstone at 8.5. Wow. 
men do put in a lot of effort for a day, don't they? Anyway, moving on. When Debbie opened the door, Michael thought she looked even more beautiful than he had remembered. She was wearing a long blue dress with a frilly white silk collar and cuffs that covered every part of her body from neck to ankles. And yet, she could not have been more desirable. She wore almost no makeup except a touch of lipstick that Michael already had plans to remove. Her green eyes sparkled. Say something, she said, smiling. You look quite stunning, Debbie, was all he could think of as he handed her the roses. How sweet of you, she replied and invited him in. Michael followed her into the kitchen where she hammered the long stems and arranged the flowers in a porcelain vase. She then led him into the living room where she placed the roses on an oval table beside a photograph of two small boys. Have you time for a drink? Sure, I booked a table at Elaine's for 8.30. Oh, my favorite restaurant, she said with a smile that revealed a small dimple on her cheek. Without asking, Debbie poured two whiskeys and handed one of them to Michael. What a good memory she has, he thought, as he nervously kept picking up and putting down his glass, like a teenager on his first date. When Michael had eventually finished his drink, Debbie suggested that they should leave. Elaine wouldn't keep a table free for one minute, even if you were Henry Kissinger. Michael laughed and helped her on with her coat. As she unlashed the door, he realized there was no babysitter or sound of children. They must be staying with, her, with their father, he thought. Once in the street, he hailed a cab and directed a driver to 87th and 2nd. Michael had never been to Elaine's before. The restaurant had been recommended by a friend from ABC who had assured him that joint will give you more than half a chance. As they entered the crowded room and waited by the bar for the mater, Michael could see it was the type of place that was frequently that was frequented by the rich and famous and wondered if his pocket could stand the expense and more importantly, whether such an outlay would turn out to be a worthwhile investment. A waiter guided them to a small table at the back of the room, where they both had another whiskey while they studied the menu. When the waiter returned to take their order, Debbie wanted no first course, just the way Picardy. So Michael ordered the same for himself. She refused the addition of garlic butter. Michael allowed his expectations to rise slightly. How's Adrian? she asked. Oh, as well as can be expected, Michael replied. He sends you his love, of course. He emphasized the word love. How kind of him to remember me and please return mine. What brings you to New York this time, Michael? Another film? No, New York may well have become everybody's second city. But this time, I only came to see you. To see me? Yes, I had a tape to edit while I was in Washington. But I always knew I could be through with that by lunch today, so I hoped you would be free to spend an evening with me. Oh, I'm flattered. You shouldn't be, she smiled, the wheel arrived. Looks good, said Michael. Tastes good too, said Debbie. When do you fly home? Tomorrow morning, 11 o'clock flight, I'm afraid. Not left yourself time to do much in New York, I see. I only came up to see you. Michael repeated. Debbie continued eating her whale. Why would any man want to divorce you, Debbie? Oh, nothing very original, I'm afraid. He fell in love with a 22-year-old blonde and left his 32-year-old wife. Isn't that a contradiction in terms? Oh, no, I don't think so. I never thought it unnatural to desire someone else. After all, it's a long life to go through and be expected never to want another woman. I'm not so sure I agree with you, said Debbie, thoughtfully. I would like to have remained faithful to one man. Oh, sorry, I completely missed a very important part. My bad. So let's go back. Uh, I only came up to see you, Michael repeated. Debbie continued eating her whale. Why would any man want to divorce you, Debbie? Oh, nothing very original, I'm afraid. He fell in love with a 22-year-old blonde and left his 32-year-old wife, she replied. 
silly man. He should have had an affair with the 22-year-old blonde and remained faithful to his 32-year-old wife. Isn't that a contradiction in terms? Debbie said. Oh no, I don't think so. I've never thought it unnatural to desire someone else. After all, it's a long life to go through and be expected never to want another woman, said Michael. Well, I'm not so sure I agree with you, said Debbie, thoughtfully. I would like to have remained faithful to one man. Oh hell, thought Michael. Not a very auspici auspicious philosophy. Do you miss him? He tried again. Yes, sometimes. It's truly what they say in the glossy menopause magazines. One can be very lonely when you suddenly find yourself on your own. That sounds more promising, thought Michael, and he heard himself saying, Yes, I can understand that, but someone like you shouldn't have to stay on your own for very long. Demi made more reply. Michael refilled her glass of wine nearly to the brim, hoping he could order a second bottle before she finished her wheel. Are you trying to get me drunk, Michael? If you think it will help, he replied laughingly. Debbie didn't laugh. Michael tried again. Been to the theater lately? Yes, I went to Evita last week. I loved it. Wonder who took you, thought Michael. But my mother fell asleep in the middle of the second act. I think I shall have to go and see it on my own on a second time. I only wish I was staying long enough to take you. That would be fun, she said. But as I shall have to be satisfied with seeing the show in London. With your wife? Another bottle of wine, please, waiter. No more for me, Michael. Really. Well, you can help me out a little. The waiter faded away. Do you get to England at all yourself? Asked Michael. No, I've only been once when Roger, my ex, took the whole family. I love the country. It fulfilled every one of my hopes. But I'm afraid we did what all Americans are expected to do. The Tower of London, Buckingham Palace, followed by Oxford and Stratford, before flying on to Paris. A sad way to see London. There's so much more I could have shown you. I suspect when the English come to America, they don't see much outside of New York, Washington, LA, and perhaps San Francisco. I agree, said Michael, not wanting to disagree. The waiter cleared away their empty plates. Can I tempt you with a dessert, Debbie? No, no, I'm trying to lose some weight. Michael slipped a hand gently around her waist. You don't need to, he said. You feel just perfect. She laughed. He smiled. Nevertheless, I'll stick to coffee, please. A little brandy? No, thank you. Just coffee. Black? Black. Coffee for two, please, Michael said to the hovering waiter. I wish I had taken you somewhere a little quieter and less... Austenius, he said, turning back to Debbie. Why? Michael took her hand. It felt cold. I would like to have said things to you that shouldn't be listened to by people on the next table. I don't think anyone would be shocked by what they overheard at Elaine's, Michael. Very well then. Do you believe in love at first sight? No, but I think it's possible to be physically attracted to a person on first meeting them. Well, I must confess, I was to you. Again, she made no reply. The coffee arrived and Debbie released her hand to take a sip. Michael followed suit. There were 150 women in that room that night we met, Debbie, and my eyes never left you once. Even during the film? I'd seen the damn thing a hundred times. I feared I might never see you again. Oh, I'm touched. Why should you be? It must be happening to you all the time. Now and then, she said. But I haven't taken anyone too seriously since my husband left me. Oh, I'm sorry. No need. It's just not that easy to get over someone you've lived with for 10 years. I doubt if many divorces are quite that willing to jump into bed with the first man who comes along, as all the latest films suggest. Michael took a hand again, hoping fervently he did not fall into that category. It's been such a lovely evening. Why don't we stroll down to the carriel and listen to Bobby Strott? Michael's ABC friend had recommended the move if he felt he was still in with a chance. Yes, I'd enjoy that, said Debbie. Michael called for the bill, $87. Had it been his wife sitting on the other side of the table, he would have checked each item carefully. 
but not on this occasion. He just left five $20 bills on a side plate and didn't wait for the change. As they stepped out onto the Second Avenue, he took Debbie's hand and together they started walking downtown. On Madison Avenue, they stopped in front of shop windows and he bought her a fur coat, a Cartier watch and a Balenciaga dress. Debbie thought it was lucky that all the stores were closed. They arrived at the carrier just in time for the 11 o'clock show. A waiter flashing a pen torch guided them through the little dark room on the ground floor to a table in the corner. Michael ordered a bottle of champagne as Bobby Shot struck up a chord and drawled out the words. Georgia, Georgia, oh my sweet. Michael, now unable to speak to Debbie above the noise of the band, satisfied himself with holding her hand and when the entertainer sang, this time we almost made the pieces fit, didn't we, gal? He leaned over and kissed her on the cheek. She turned and smiled. Was it faintly conspiratorial or was he just wishful thinking? And then she sipped her champagne. On the door of 12, Bobby Shot shut the piano lid and said, Good night, my friends. The time has come for all you good people to go to bed. And some of you naughty ones too. Michael laughed a little too loud, but he was pleased that Debbie laughed as well. They strolled down Madison Avenue to 68th Street, chatting about inconsequential affairs, while Michael's thoughts were often only one affair. When they arrived at her 68th Street apartment, she took out her latch key. Would you like a nightcap? She asked without any suggestive intonation. No more drink, thank you, Debbie, but I would certainly appreciate a coffee. She led him into the living room. The flowers have lasted well, she teased, and left him to make the coffee. Michael amused himself by flicking through an old copy of Time magazine, looking at the pictures, not taking in the words. She returned after a few minutes with a coffee pot and two small cups on a lacquer tray. She poured the coffee, black again, and then sat down next to Michael on the couch, drawing one leg underneath her, while turning slightly towards him. Michael downed his coffee in two gulps, scalding his mouth slightly. Then putting down his cup, he leaned over and kissed her on the mouth. She was still clutching onto her coffee cup. Her eyes opened briefly as she mancoured the cup onto a side table. After another long kiss, she broke away from him. I ought to make an early start in the morning. So should I, said Michael, but I'm more worried about not seeing you again for a really long time. What a nice thing to say, Debbie replied. No, I just care, he said, before kissing her again. This time she responded. He slipped one hand on her breast, while the other one began to undo the raw of little buttons down the back of her dress. She broke away again. Don't, let's do anything, let's not do anything we'll regret. I know we won't regret it, said Michael. He then kissed her on the neck and shoulders, slipping her dress off and moved deftly towards her body to her breast. Delighted to find she... Okay, this is too much for you two. Shall we go upstairs, Debbie? I'm too old to make love on the sofa. Without speaking, she rose and led him by the hand to her bedroom, which smelled faintly and deliciously of the scent she herself was wearing. She switched on a small bedside light and took off the rest and letting him fall where she stood. Michael never once took eyes off her, and he was on the other side of the bed. He slipped in and quickly joined her in bed. When they had finished an experience he hadn't enjoyed as much for a long time, he lay there pondering on the fact that she had succumbed at all, especially on their first date. They lay silently in each other's arms before making love for a second time, which was every bit as delightful as the first. Michael then fell into a deep sleep. He woke first the next morning and stared across at the beautiful woman who lay by his side. The digital clock on the bedside table showed 7.03. He touched her forehead slightly with his lips and began to stroke her hair. She woke lazily and smiled upon at him. Then they made love again. And but every bit as pleasing as the night before. He didn't speak as she slipped out of the bed and ran a bath for him before going to the kitchen to prepare breakfast. Michael, I don't know how many people are actually watching this. 
I think there's one person watching this. And there are two likes. Okay, anyway. Moving back. How he wished that agent could see him now. Okay, one second. He woke first the next morning and stared across at the beautiful woman who lay by his side. The digital clock on the bedside table showed 7.03. He touched her forehead slightly with his lips and began to stroke her head. She woke lazily and smiled up at him. Then they made love, love again, gently, but every bit as pleasing as the night before. He didn't speak as she slipped out of bed and ran a bath for him before going to the kitchen to prepare breakfast. Michael relaxed in the hot bath, crooning a bobby shot number at the top of his voice. How he wished that Adrian could see him now. He dried himself and dressed before joining Debbie in the smart little kitchen where she shared breakfast together. Eggs, bacon toast, English marmalade and steaming black coffee. Debbie then had a bath and dressed while Michael read the New York Times. When she reappeared in the living room wearing a smart cold dress, he was sorry to be leaving so soon. He must leave now or you'll miss your flight. Michael rose reluctantly and Debbie drove him back to his hotel where he quickly threw his clothes into a suitcase, settled the bill for his unslept in double bed and joined her back in the car. On the journey to the airport, they chatted about coming elections and pumpkin pie, almost as if they had been married for years or were both avoiding admitting the previous night had ever happened. Debbie dropped Michael in front of the Pan Am building and put the car in the parking lot before joining him at the check-in counter. They waited for his flight to be called. Pan American announces the departure of the flight number 006 to London Heathrow. Will all passengers please proceed with their boarding passes to gate number 9? When they reached the passengers only barrier, Michael took Debbie briefly in his arms. Thank you for a memorable evening, he said. No, it is I who must thank you, Michael, she replied as she kissed him on the cheek. I must confess, I hadn't thought it would end up quite like that, he said. Why not, she asked. Not easy to explain, he replied, searching for words that would flatter and not embarrass. Let's say I was surprised that you were surprised that we ended up in bed together on our first night. You shouldn't be. I shouldn't? No, this is simple enough explanation. My friends all told me when I got divorced to find myself a man and have a one-night stand. The idea sounded fun, but I didn't like the thought of the men in New York thinking I was easy. See, she touched him gently on the side of his face. So when I met you and Adrian, both safely living over 3,000 3, miles away, I thought to myself, whichever one of you comes back first... Interesting. Clearly, women are not very different from men. But I think I'm going to read the last part again because I didn't do a good job of it. All right, let me do this again. Um, no, there's a simple enough... Okay, you were surprised that we ended up in bed together on our first night? You shouldn't be, said Debbie. I shouldn't, said Michael. No, there's a simple enough explanation. My friends all told me when I got divorced to find myself a man and have a one-night stand. The idea sounded fun, but I, didn't, but I didn't like the thought of the men in New York thinking I was easy. She touched him gently on the side of his face. So when I met you and Adrian, both safely living over 3,000 miles away, I thought to myself, whichever one of you comes back first. All right, guys, that was my live stream. I don't think anybody watched this, but it is what it is. See you on the other side.